Tonight we're going to be looking at the stars for National Astronomy Week 2025 and I'm recording this about a week before National Astronomy Week. The only difference is that the moon isn't in the sky at the moment and it will be moving from a crescent in this direction I'm looking at at the moment up to a gibbous phase during the week. But at least we'll be able to look at the planets and stars that you'll be able to see during National Astronomy Week without the moon in the sky. And the most obvious feature you can see right in the middle of the picture there is the planet Venus, the really bright object over in the southwest at the moment. Incidentally, I'm recording this from uh, the Thames Valley, and we're about 15 miles from Heathrow Airport, so we will get a lot of planes, but I guess a lot of us have to put up with those these days. Directly below Venus you can see the planet Saturn, that sort of spark which is uh, really not very bright at the moment. There's a good reason for it which is that its famous rings are more or less edge on to us at the moment and that means that they're not adding their brightness to the brightness of the planet itself. And it will be about the same height above the horizon during National Astronomy Week, but Venus will have moved a bit higher in the sky during the week, so it will be in roughly the same position. Venus the brightest planet because it's completely cloud covered and it's also the can become the closest planet to Earth. It is certainly the closest at the moment and that's why it's so bright in the sky. Now I'm going to look at some other objects and I'm going to move the field of view up a bit and there we can see the sort of diamond or square. It's actually the square of Pegasus that and okay it's not quite a square but we have to put up with the stars in the arrangements they are and that's a good guide to one of the most famous objects in the sky other than the planets and that is the Andromeda galaxy. It's a galaxy like our own Milky Way but it's about two and a half million light years away and I'm going to show you how you can find it either with the naked eye or with just binoculars from more or less wherever you are. Now the way to do it is to take the, a line through the bottom right and the upper left of uh, square of Pegasus there and then you will find other stars of the stars of Andromeda. If I move the field of view up there you can just get them into the field of view. You can see that the top left star of the square of Pegasus is actually one of the line of three stars that make up the uh, make up Andromeda with planes going through at the moment and it's those three stars if you take the middle of those three stars and then move two fainter stars to the right you will come to a little misty patch. Now you might not be able to see it at the moment but I'm just going to adjust the shutter speed of the camera Here we go. Now can you see a little fuzzy patch just to the right of those two stars and that is the Andromeda galaxy. Now you might be able to see it with a naked eye if you've got a good dark sky but otherwise use binoculars and you will see it. I've seen it with binoculars from the centre of London from Hyde Park so I know it can be done. Let's have a look at the picture of it close up. It is, uh, say, two and a half million light years away. And whenever I look at that, I always think there are probably alien eyes looking towards our galaxy, which would look very much in their sky as the Andromeda galaxy does in ours. And they're wondering what we are and who, we're, who we are and what we look like. And of course, we can never contact each other because two and a half million years at the speed of light, that's how long it would take to get there. And there's just no way we can ever contact those people. Uh, so uh, without completely unknown technology, even Star Trek not technology, couldn't get to the Andromeda galaxy in a lifetime so we will never actually know who were there unless we pick up some strange radio signal from them maybe in the future but that's something to to picture and wonder about. Now I'm going to do to move back down towards Venus and then pan round the rest of the sky and if we move I better adjust the exposure time so we have more realistic views of what we're looking at. There we go. Now you probably recognize the constellation at the 
lower left there, it's the constellation of Orion. The three stars in the line are the most famous feature in the sky almost, and those are the belt of Orion, Orion the Hunter, and that's his belt. And below his belt, he's wearing his sword, and he's dangling from the belt. You can see there three stars, what look like three stars, below the three, three in the belt. And those, at the centre of those three stars, is another fuzzy patch, and that is the Orion Nebula. It is a birthplace of stars, and in photographs it looks extremely beautiful and coloured. But I'm sorry to say that if you look at it through a telescope, you will never see the colours. It's just not possible with human eyes to see the colours in the Orion Nebula, at least certainly not as bright as they appear in a photograph. But that, as I say, is the birthplace of stars. Does that mean we're likely to see a star suddenly appearing there? No, because stars take millions of years to uh, to evolve and appear and be born. So uh, we are not likely to see one just suddenly pop into existence there. But there are plenty in there, and looking in photographs, you can see just what an amazing sight it is. Now the star at the top left of the quadrilateral that surrounds Orion there. It's called Betelgeuse, and that is a star which achie achieved some notoriety a few years ago by people saying that it was liable to explode and become a supernova at any time, which is actually true. But that means at any time within the next thousand years or so, so don't expect it to happen during National Astronomy Week. Moving upwards from there, you can see at the top of the picture already, is another very interesting part of the sky. Normally we'd say this is the constellation of Taurus, but its dominant feature at the moment is the planet Jupiter, which is not quite as bright as Venus, but you really can't miss it in the sky, even if you've got a rather cloudy sky. Jupiter up there, really high this year, and that's one reason why we've held National Astronomy Week this year, because it's such a brilliant sight. And also you can see that little patch of, of stars, which we call the Seven Sisters, or the Pleiades Star Cluster. They were born several million years ago in a in a nebula like the Orion Nebula, but they've expanded away from there and now they're passing through our sky. You won't see any change in them over even millennia. The ancient astronomers who built Stonehenge or back in the period over the pyramids would have seen the stars looking as they do now. But the, the Pleiades there have, uh, are comparatively young stars, very bright stars in their own right. The V-shape of stars just to the lower right of Jupiter is called the Hyades Cluster, and that's another group of stars that were all born together uh, many millions of years ago. The one at the bottom of the V is called Aldebaran, and that is a red giant star, uh, a bit like Betelgeuse that I showed you a short while ago, and a very, uh, very large star, but in our sky it looks about the same as any of the others. Now I want to show you the other bright planet that we've got in the sky at the moment and so I need to move along over to the left again. Now we're looking over to the east and you can see there in the middle I've got the constellation of Gemini but we've also got the planet Mars and the Mars is the brightest star there brightest object is a planet of course and the two stars to its upper left are the stars Castor and Pollux, the brightest stars in the constellation of Gemini, the twins. Mars is definitely reddish, I can see it as definitely reddish, it might not show up so bright in the in the camera but if you go and look at it I promise you you will see it as, as reddish in colour if you compare it with Jupiter which is sort of creamy, creamy white and Venus which is pure white you will see the differences in colour straight away. There's one constellation a lot of people don't recognise so easily and that's immediately above We've got one of the, the brightest stars in the sky, and that's the constellation of Auriga. 
and you can, as you can see, you can find it looking to the uh, to the left of Jupiter as well. And that plane there is definitely trying to get into the act as well. Auriga with the bright star Capella up at the top there. And so that's a very prominent constellation at this time of year. And Capella is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Oh, that plane's just going to hit it. Uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, went right through it. But Capella, of course, escaped unscathed by the attentions of the plane just above where I'm looking. Going to move around a bit now and see what else we can find. Going down towards the north is a constellation which I'm sure virtually everybody recognises and that is what we call the Plough. The Plough is actually just the brightest stars of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. And you probably know that that's a good way to find the North Star. So we're going to do that. And if you take the two right-hand stars of the, of the Plough, or the, the bowl of the saucepan if you prefer, and follow them upwards, you come to the Pole Star. So I'm going to put that right in the middle of the, the field of view now. There it is, the Pole Star. If you find that from wherever you normally look from your home, you will see that it's always in the same position in the sky whenever you look. The whole rest of the sky rotates around the Pole Star or appears to rotate around the Pole Star. It doesn't, the sky doesn't rotate, of course, it's the Earth moving, but it is the star that's directly above the North Pole of the Earth, so it stays in exactly the same place in the sky. So if ever you're lost in, in, in uh, some other time of year, find the Pole Star and you'll be able to find the other stars that are in the sky, like the, the plough there from that. In the summer, you'll find, in the later spring and summer, you'll find the plough is more or less overhead. But once you've found the Pole Star, you can find the others. Now I'm going to move a bit further to the west and down here we have a rather nice constellation called Cygnus. Actually that is a, star, uh, a constellation which is overhead in summer <coughs> but it's also called the Northern Cross. Cygnus is a swan and it's flying down towards the horizon. The bright star at the top called Deneb is actually the tail of the swan and right above that tree there is the head of the swan, a star called Albario which is rather a nice little double star. And the other bright star there over to the right of Cygnus and uh, again quite low to the, to the horizon is the star Vega. Now in summer that is overhead and it swaps places with Capella so you've always got a bright star more or less overhead in both summer and winter but that one is um, is Vega and an, a, 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 in the constellation of Lyra another interesting feature in the sky. Now we move back and we come back to Venus.